Now. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I see so many familiar faces, but for those of you who do not yet know me, I'm Michael Scharf. I'm the co-dean of the law school, and um, Professor Shevalala invited me to give the dean's welcome for this wonderful event today. So welcome to the annual Spangenberg Distinguished Speaker, um, which we're in for a real treat today. But let me give you some background about the Law Technology and the Arts Center, also known as the Spangenberg Center. It is um, supported by a very generous grant from the Spangenberg Family Foundation. And uh, the Spangenbergs are key legal innovators in the technology world. Um, LTA, the Law, Technology, and the Arts Center, has a history of strong work on entrepreneurship and innovation, and it attracts students, uh, and it is a center of research that is becoming world-renowned. Um, bringing Anthony uh, Tony Tobman, head of the Intellectual Property Division in the WTO Secretariat, is an example of the growing international reach of the program from our collaboration with CEIPI in Strasbourg to our internships at the World Intellectual Property Organization and our World Intellectual Property Organization Research Lab that Professor Shabalala helps run and mentors the students who are working on all sorts of cutting edge issues assigned to us by that international organization. I should say that when you come to many law schools, you would see the American flag, but very few have the United Nations flag. So we're glad to have that for you, Tony. Um, I'll give you a short welcome about Tony and then Professor Shavalala will tell you more about him. But we're really, really pleased to have you here as our 2016 Spangenberg Distinguished Speaker. Um, you're in great company. Uh, we previously welcomed for our inaugural Spangenberg Distinguished Speaker last year, Judge Alex Kaczynski from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, who had done a lot of really important legal decisions in the field of intellectual property. Now the WTO, as you all probably know, is the preeminent international institution for international trade. And maybe more controversially, the talk today will focus on the intellectual property aspects of the World Trade Organization. Um, Tony Taubman comes to case with a long distinguished record of service in international intellectual property policy work, first at the World Intellectual Property Organization and now with the World Trade Organization. He has shepherded the division and member states through the rough waters of the post-Doha round era. And he's come all the way from Geneva to be with us today. And so I'm going to have Professor Shabalala say a few more words, but it is my great pleasure to have Tony here today and to welcome you all for a great speech. Thank you. So one of the great privileges of spending time in international negotiations um, is that you get to know people very, very well, both for good and for ill. And I have to say that one of the advantages of my experience has been that I can call in favors because I know things about people that other people don't want to know. And so I was able to exercise some of that privilege in inviting Tony to come and speak here at Case. Tony has been, as I said, uh, has had a distinguished record of service in international uh, policy work. First in the diplomatic corps um, in Australia, and then in academia before shifting to work at the World Intellectual Property Organization in one of the most innovative divisions there at, at WIPO in a new area of work that first was traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions and then became the global issues section at WIPO which tried to really bring that relatively state organization into dealing with issues of the 21st century. When we and many of us heard that the WTO, which for those of us who'd worked on access to information and access to knowledge issues, heard that the WTO was hiring Tony Taubman to work and head up their, I, their IP division, I have to say somewhat of a cheer went up because it finally felt as if the institutions had finally heard the argument that you have to be driven by concerns for real policy outcomes and not by the ideology and faith that greater intellectual property protection will always lead to good things. And Tony has brought that rigor and that concern for 
real concrete policy outcomes to his work at the WTO. And it is in no way his fault that the WTO has had a rough seven years of negotiations on intellectual property issues that have resulted in very little progress. One can only blame the member countries one of which, of course, is the U.S., and one of which is my own lovely country of South Africa, who played their part. But what has happened to the WTO during his tenure is that the WTO, as a means of and a venue for discuss discussing real substantive policy concerns around intellectual property, has grown and has become significant and influential in that area. And today, Tony is going to give us and talk to us about one of the core areas of concern, which is the interaction between the WTO and the TRIPS agreement and the proliferation of regional and bilateral free trade agreements addressing intellectual property. And so it is my pleasure to introduce my good friend and colleague, Tony Talman. Well, thank you very much, Diego. Uh, and uh, thank you to all you all for, for joining me here. I must admit, coming to case uh, under the title of distinguished speaker, I, I thought uh, it's somewhat perverse, given that the faculty here is entirely populated by distinguished speakers, including the, the two who have just preceded me. Uh, but uh, I'm really honoured to have the opportunity to, to come and discuss uh, in a very international faculty, but for me, a bit off-Broadway, to talk about uh, one of the real challenges that uh, we do face uh, looking at the the world of international intellectual property law and i'm told that you are all uh, fearsomely well-informed uh, lawyers that uh, uh, I, I do want to focus on some very specific uh, legal questions that that we do have to to wrestle with uh, but uh, diego is right in the sense at least that uh, we do have to wrestle with uh, major policy issues i don't think we've necessarily been successful in doing that, but uh, that's really why I'm here, to uh, explore some of the, the challenges that uh, lie bef before us uh, and uh, to, to really uh, uh, raise some, some deeper policy questions about what, the, uh, what is international intellectual property here for, what's, what's it meant to do, uh, and uh, in what direction is it going, is it going to uh, serve the purpose we, we hope for it. Uh, this is um, my own view. We, we don't have an official view uh, on the, the issues I'm, I'm uh, discussing. Uh, that's really why I'm, I'm here, to, to uh, start a, uh, a more informal dialogue about these, these questions. Uh, and I always run out of time. Uh, I'm one of those ter terrible people with too many slides and too much to say. So let me get it off my chest to begin with. Firstly, uh, the TRIPS agreement, the WTO agreement that came into force, uh, what, 21 years ago, uh, its purpose, its, its intent was to bring the rule of law to international disputes about IP. We will have international disputes about intellectual property. In a sense, it's too, too, too important to modern economies for that not to happen. Uh, and what the TRIPS agreement, uh, our, our WTO IP agreement, uh, was intended to do was firstly to, to articulate what is an adequate level of protection uh, in substantively and what is it uh, to have effective protection uh, and then to resolve any concerns about that through an equitable, equitable dispute settlement procedure. Before that, we did not have the rule of law, uh, and it was a matter of um, unilateral determination, if you like, uh, to, to, to set the standards and to, to retaliate if, uh, if, the, if the standards weren't met. So it was very much about establishing the rule of law. In doing so, it, in a sense, invented an idea of legitimate trade. Uh, that is to say, legitimate trade is, is non-infringing trade. Uh, that's the kind of trade, this is a trade agreement, that's the kind of trade that should be allowed to flow uh, without impediment. But on the other hand, it inverted the logic of conventional trade law. Conventional trade law is about uh, eliminating uh, barriers to trade, generally speaking. Uh, the TRIPS agreement 
created barriers to trade, but to trade that it considered illegitimate, infringing trade. Uh, this was a, a major uh, revolution, a major upheaval in trade law, and there are still people who, who rail against this. Uh, uh, they see it as a, a subversion of the very purpose of trade law. It's not meant to be about uh, putting barriers in the path of, of, of trade. They, they claim it's, it's actually about domestic regulation, it's not a trade matter. Uh, nonetheless, uh, TRIPS is there, and it created this idea of legitimacy legitimacy of, uh, of trade, that is to say, non-infringing trade. Uh, now, I would maintain, I would have to maintain, I suppose, that this idea of the rule of law has worked. It has had uh, uh, the intended effect of creating a, a, an established, uh, rules-based, transparent way of resolving uh, disputes against objective, agreed standards. That's the very purpose of it. Uh, and we don't have the, the, the kind of uncertainty and upheaval that we did experience in the, in the late 80s especially. However, uh, that did not settle matters by any means. And, and in fact, in the 20 years since TRIPS, we have seen a huge upheaval in bilateral and regional trade agreements, uh, agreements between two or uh, several parties that cover exactly the same territory as TRIPS in all sorts of different ways that I'll, I'll, I'll cover, both in terms of substantive law, uh, developing and elaborating new standards, but also determining how, it's, how that law should be enforced domestically, and establishing, in most cases, alternative dispute settlement fora. So that poses an institutional challenge for a multilateral system such as the WTO both in terms of the norms and in terms of how the, the norms are applied uh, and disputes uh, resolved. And my parting point, point will be, uh, if we do have a international intellectual property system that hinges on this concept of legitimacy of adequate and agreed, uh, adequate and effective agreed standards uh, as the linchpin of a, of a more stable, predictable, fairer international environment. What happens when we take that system and layer on it uh, successive developments of bilateral and regional norms and standards? How does that uh, affect that fundamental formula, that fundamental deal that was struck 21 years ago? Uh, do, do we, will we see fragmentation? Will we see uh, clustering of differing ideas of, of what's legitimate, what's, uh, what's adequate, what's effective? Or will we see a, a kind of a composite evolve over time? We're very much at the, at the crossroads right now. And I'm here making this, uh, this uh, plea because I don't know the answer and I'm, I'm keen to find out. It leaves us with these overall questions. If we do have multilateral institutions that are responsible for establishing standards, uh, the, the linchpin of this rule of law, and yet we see norm setting, development of new standards in, in a whole host of, of different uh, bilateral regional environments, where's the center of gravity? Uh, is it that, that there is still a kind of a focus on the multilateral system, uh, what we organize in Geneva? Or is it, uh, is, is it really lost its uh, sheen? Is it uh, really fading into irrelevance? What does this mean for a truly international law of IP? Uh, will that become uh, fragmented, more diverse? Or, or will we see from this uh, very vigorous uh, norm setting activity, will we see some interesting new themes develop? Uh, and finally, we will have to talk about Lasagna at some point because that was on the flyer. So I, I don't want to go over, certainly don't want to go over ancient history, but just some context. Uh, multilateral trade law goes back to 1947. The GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, it's in that order appropriately. The very f focus of it was very much on tariffs. That's what trade negotiations were about. It was about reducing tariffs. But uh, with economic shifts, particularly in the 70s, the 80s, uh, counterfeit trade became a major concern for the US and other developed economies. Uh, and there were attempts to uh, develop a code uh, to 
in a sense, create trade barriers for counterfeit trade. That was uns unsuccessful, but in 1986, with the launch of um, a comprehensive round of trade negotiations, we saw agreement to no uh, negotiate something rather odd, trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. Uh, and that at, that at that time, that was more or less a diplomatic formula to bring in the concept of intellectual property protection into the trade law system without really giving any guidance as to what that actually meant. And if you look at the records of the first negotiating group uh, meeting after this uh, negotiation was launched, the main question was, what on earth are these trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights? Uh, and for several years, that, that, that uh, conceptual debate continued. It was resolved uh, and was ro resolved by basically saying uh, the trade-related aspects means that uh, not only will there be, will, will there be uh, safeguards against counterfeit trade, but it will be a requirement if you join the WTO to have intellectual property protection at home domestically established to what are considered multilaterally to be adequate and effective standards. That is what the TRIPS agreement is. That was concluded in 1994, entered into force the following year. That's our, that's our TRIPS agreement and it is part of the package. Uh, you can't be a member, unless you're in the least developed country, you can't be a member of the WTO unless you comply with those standards today. Now what happened then is very interesting because effectively this sent the signal that, well, okay, when you're negotiating trade agreements, intellectual property is literally part of the deal. And so one of the unexpected but really quite compelling outcomes of our multilateral agreement on trade-related intellectual property meant that when two trading partners negotiated bilaterally, they too would insert an intellectual property chapter. Sometimes, and we'll see a couple of these, sometimes it was a bit odd. Basically, uh, you get the impression they looked at each other and said, well, we're having a trade negotiations. We need to say something about intellectual property. I mean, do you have anything? No, not really. Well, why don't we reaffirm our commitment to the TRIPS agreement? Uh, and we see that in a number of uh, agreements, but uh, in other agreements, we see really a rewriting of some, some major uh, standards in the TRIPS agreement, some, some very significant um, elaboration of uh, inter international intellectual property law. Uh, and that's the, that's the phenomenon that, that I'd like to, to talk about. Not only bilaterals or what we call regionals, but now the, the mega regionals. Uh, and uh, the most obvious example now is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, leaving some uncertainty about what, what do we do in the multilateral world. Do we uh, just watch this and, and uh, wait for something to happen? Or does it have real implications for how we work? And there's a lot going on. The, the redder uh, countries uh, have uh, upwards of 40 separate uh, bilateral trade deals. Uh, there's all sorts of ways of counting these, uh, but uh, in, in a technical sense, we have 454 on the books uh, in, in the WTO, 267 currently in force. Uh, many of these have intellectual property uh, uh, chapters to them. Singapore is an example. These are the, these are the countries that Singapore has uh, uh, bilateral trade deals with. Uh, a number of countries have that, that level of activity. These are separate trade deals with each of these each of these economies, saying parallel but not identical things, uh, raising uh, uh, real challenges. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, recently concluded is um, an enormously um, uh, far-reaching uh, regional uh, trade deal, which says a lot that is very new about international intellectual property. Likewise, the Transatlantic uh, Trade and Investment Partnership still under negotiation between the US and the EU. So this is the, the, uh, the way it's developed uh, using our, our statistics. And uh, the sharp increase uh, commences exactly when uh, the TRIPS agreement is concluded. So if it was meant to put uh, an end to uh, questions about what, is, what are adequate and effective standards, if it was meant to be the uh, multilateral choice 
for uh, extending the rule of law to disputes about intellectual property matters, it certainly hasn't worked from that point of view because uh, our members, WTO members, uh, member governments, uh, have uh, very actively gone out and done deals uh, uh, to, to covering the same territory. Uh, let's consider what this means in terms of our legal uh, structures. Uh, GATT, the original multilateral trade agreement, uh, was very much about goods. Uh, and what's interesting is that it, it developed from being an entirely diplomatic uh, forum for resolving trade disputes to an increasingly judicial style, an increasingly legalistic style. This is a, 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 an area of legal practice, if you like, that uh, evolved over time in a kind of a common law way. It was only later codified when the WTO was, was concluded. The GATT uh, express, uh, dealt with intellectual property in a classic trade law way, as an exception. It said, well, it certainly, it said, well, certainly don't want, don't, you certainly don't need to protect intellectual property. Absolutely don't feel obliged to. If you do have to protect or you do choose to protect intellectual property, just make sure you don't do it in a way that interferes with trade. Uh, that's, that's a, it's a, don't do it in a way that discriminates between countries. Don't do it in a way that is a disguised restriction on international trade. And we have jurisprudence. We have dispute settlement jurisprudence from that time. Uh, dealing with exactly that question. That, that case, Section 337 of the Tariffs Act, uh, deals with the, uh, exactly that question, where a, a border uh, enforcement measure was considered discriminatory against uh, products being imported. That's classic trade law applied to IP. Certainly no need to protect it, and if you do, make sure you don't, don't do it in a, in a way that uh, interferes illegitimately with trade. Uh, now, the GATT uh, was the centre of, of, of action until 1994, when the World Trade Organization took its place. Uh, the GATT was provisional all that time. Also a reminder that uh, to be effective, uh, international law can have different characters. Uh, it was not, the GATT didn't exist as an international organization. Uh, and it was only very late in the negotiations that, that, that it was agreed that the WTO should be an international organization at all with international legal character. That was very late in the negotiations. Uh, but it was uh, so established, which is an extraordinarily good thing because it gave me a job. Uh, and, but it brought with it also this two, two things we need to focus on, the TRIPS agreement. So it meant that uh, positive standards for protection of intellectual property intellectual property protection as a requirement of trade law, not an exception, but the inverse, a requirement of trade law uh, was built in, welded into the WTO legal system. Uh, and the dispute settlement understanding, which is the codification and elaboration of the dispute settlement practice, confirming that dispute settlement would be done in this more judicial, quasi-judicial manner, not as a, a form of, uh, um, of diplomacy, but as a, a finding of uh, uh, legal determinations against the, against, the, against the treaties. And that was a pivotal point, uh, both for trade law generally, but also for uh, international IP law, because it meant that uh, if I don't like your intellectual property system, the way that my complaint is framed, the way that it is dealt with, is far more uh, rigorous and uh, judicial in character than in the past, when it was uh, much more of a diplomatic exchange. Mm -hmm. So this meant that intellectual property became recognized generally as an interest, a uh, legitimate interest, if you like, uh, uh, in trade negotiations. Uh, the TRIPS agreement, in a nutshell, is an agreement that intellectual property is trade related. And we see this, this inversion of uh, the character of intellectual property in trade law, quite a, quite a revolutionary step. Why did this come about? Well, we don't need to go further than the preamble of TRIPS to see. Firstly, that idea that we needed objective, transparent, agreed multilateral standards as to what is adequate. So if I'm unhappy about your intellectual property system, it's not a subjective matter, it is uh, 
a matter assessed against objective standards. Concern that intellectual property protection should not interfere with legitimate trade. That idea that we saw back even in the GATT days, that yes, protect intellectual property, but don't let it interfere with trade. Uh, it's a trade agreement. Uh, one, one area that need, needs more emphasis, even in the negotiations on TRIPS and certainly in the TRIPS standards, is the recognition of public policy objectives. So TRIPS does not say you better protect intellectual property for its own sake. It says intellectual property should be protected to do good public policy things, to promote innovation, to promote access to the fruits of innovation in a way that is equitable, that leads to a mutually beneficial outcome for technology producers and technology users. Uh, and the final point there is a reminder of the real politic. Uh, it, the preamble in the TRIPS agreement uniquely in WTO trade law refers to reducing tensions because the, the lack of rule of law over intellectual property in the 80s especially uh, was leading to real tensions and concern that where disputes arose, disputes do arise concerning intellectual property, concern that this was done in a non-transparent way is subject to unilateral measures rather than a, a multilateral procedure. So the preamble gives it away. That's exactly why we have a, a TRIPS agreement. And uh, I've left uh, a copy with Diego. We just recently published a, uh, a series of reflections of the negotiators of TRIPS. And these, it's interesting to, to uh, learn from the negotiators what they saw themselves as doing. But, this is, but the, each of those aspects is very much in, in their minds. And I would stress that, that policy dimension. Uh, to a, a large extent, it was a discussion about what is adequate and effective uh, intellectual property protection, but not in a formalistic sense, in a sense that what is required to del deliver the expected benefits of intellectual property. Uh, so we have in the TRIPS agreement uh, this idea that it is part of the deal. Legitimate trade should flow. We can't use IP as a, a means of obstructing trade. But you, have to, you now have a positive obligation to, to suppress illegitimate trade, which is, as I say, an upheaval in international trade law. Uh, we do have a multilateral standard for what is adequate and effective, which has got leeway, flexibility, so you can adapt and apply this, uh, given the diversity of the WTO's membership. Uh, what works in the US won't necessarily work in Bolivia. So they're, they're, they're flexible standards, but they are agreed uh, transparent multilateral standards. And an idea that yes, when disputes arise, those disputes will be handled, handled multilaterally. This means that the, the, the TRIPS agreement forms part. It doesn't have a standalone existence. You can't adhere to the TRIPS agreement. It is, the first words in TRIPS are Annex 1C. It is part of a much broader trade law complex, which is the, the uh, legal architecture of the WTO. Uh, and uh, the structurally, intellectual property uh, is at the very centre of the of the system uh, in terms of uh, our, our institutional framework. Uh, so th this is and, th and this is this is this is the the uh, real politic background. Uh, without trips, we did have the experience of sanctions for uh, inadequate or claimed inadequate IP protection that were unilaterally imposed according to unilaterally determined standards. Uh, and there's a huge uh, the literature at the time. Uh, Hudek uh, argued that, well, this is justified disobedience if uh, intellectual property protection is not adequate in a, in a um, lawless environment, then you are justified in taking action against it. Uh, a trade uh, economist like Bagwati, who doesn't like intellectual property anyway, uh, refers to this as aggressive unilateralism. Indonesia, when the whole package was being uh, concluded at the Marrakesh uh, con uh, conference in 1994, said, look, okay, we get it. We, we've, we've agreed to build intellectual property into the system. Fine. Just, we don't need, this is almost a literal quote, direct quote, we don't need legal harassment. We need cooperation. We need, we need to, your support in developing our institutions, developing our systems. Uh, to protect, protect intellectual property, but just please spare us the legal harassment. That's a measure of the, the spirit of the time, the concerns of the time. And, and that was a, uh, I knew the Indonesians very well at that point. It was a very direct 
concern that they would be fending off endless uh, dispute settlement uh, uh, thrown at them, uh, that they would be uh, subject to trade sanctions because they were still sorting out their enforcement of copyright and so on. It was, it was a major, major concern. So a reminder that dispute settlement is very much uh, the centre of, of, the, of the WHO system. Uh, it is meant to provide that kind of security and predictability um, to the multilateral trading system. Security and predictability, key points. This is not only uh, the way that disputes are, are handled, but also the standards that uh, disputes are measured against. Uh, major thrust, for, uh, major argument for, for the rule of law. And so our, our system, our, this is the dispute settlement understanding, this is the codification of how disputes are to be settled. It says, look, when it's about multilateral law, you've got to use the multilateral system, basically. Uh, and there you have a direct imprint of that concern that, okay, we agree to this whole package of, of law, but let's make sure that our differences are resolved through this transparent multilateral way. Now, uh, a, a, a curious twist, and it's, it's, a, it's a difficult legal question that arises in, the, in this context, one that we still haven't resolved. Uh, because trade disputes about um, trade barriers that, you know, you're, you're, you're uh, throwing uh, barriers against uh, my imports, uh, these are resolved according to very well-established jurisprudence that's developed since 1947. Uh, but when it comes to disputes about intellectual property protection, this is an entirely new category of trade dispute. Uh, and it led to uncertainty even about that basic question of what is the cause of action in a technical sense. Okay, we have the rule of law, but what is the actual legal foundation, the legal construct of uh, an allowable dispute? It can't be just the fact that I don't like the way Diabo is protecting my intellectual property. It, you know, my industry is uh, annoyed. Uh, there has to be uh, a, a formal way of constructing that cause of action. That's part, of, that's part of the deal with the, with the rule of law. Uh, and what the TRIPS agreement did was simply outsource this to the general trade law system. Now, a bit of technicality, trade law, uh, in multilateral trade law is a bit different uh, to conventional uh, law in, the, in that there are three causes of, of action. One is uh, that you're not compliant with the treaty, but there's two others. Uh, one is, well, yes, you're compliant with the treaty, sure, you, 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 you're within the letter of the law, but, but I'm still not getting the expected benefits. You are nullifying or impairing my expected benefits. The third is even more mysterious. It is the existence of any other situation that uh, means that I'm denied benefits. So it's a triple potential cause of action, three, three categories. This is confusing for trade lawyers, for experts, it's, I'm not going to even attempt to illuminate it for you uh, in, in a short amount of time. Uh, the point to bear in mind is that the, the fundamental cause of action is not non-compliance with the treaty, it is nullification and impairment of expected benefits. Uh, it, we just have a presumption that if you are not complying with your treaty obligations, that is presumed to be nullifying and impairing expect, expected benefits. So let's just sit with the idea that that's rather rather complex. It's 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 not uh, um, as as clear as simply saying you're compliant with the treaty or not. Now that's general trade law, the 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 law of trade in goods, the law of trade in services. When it comes to uh, trips, though, we still we have a, an open question. Uh, firstly, is it about simply non-compliance with the letter of the law? or a broader sense of frustration of, of legitimate expectations? Is it about uh, some form of denial of market access? If that's the case, because it's about trade, uh, market access, if that's the case, what is market access when we're talking about an intellectual property protection agreement? What, is there a new age kind of market access that, uh, that we can shift into uh, our understanding of the legal basis of a complaint? Well. This proved to be too hard uh, in the TRIPS negotiations uh, and uh, it led to a narrowing of the cause of action 
for a trips dispute just to uh, non-compliance with the treaty, with the letter of the law. And this other more confusing area, what we call non-violation disputes, that was left for subsequent negotiation. The TRIPS agreement said uh, you had to resolve this, come up with recommendations on this perplexing legal question by 1999. Uh, last year, the WTO trade ministers met in Nairobi in December 2015 uh, to consider this question, uh, 16 years beyond the, the deadline, and the decision taken was to put it off for another two years. So it's a very difficult question. Uh, I, I make the point, though, that it is at the very centre of this, this rule of law that I'm talking about. It's the very cause of action. It's the very way that you frame a dispute. My point is that we still don't have that fully resolved. We, we just don't have that resolved. In a practical sense, it doesn't matter because this is a, an unusual cause of action anyway. But f for me, it's, a, it's symbolic of the still unresolved question about what it means to deal with an, uh, a dispute about intellectual property standards, how adequate is intellectual property protection in a trade law setting, in a setting that is essentially about market access and uh, having a, an adequate competitive uh, crack at, at uh, somebody else's economy, having that market access. Uh, it's still unresolved. Now, the way that the dispute settlement has unfolded with this more narrow cause of action is extremely interesting. It's not what anyone uh, predicted. I'm not going to um, go through this snapshot. I'm simply going to say that uh, there was deep concern that uh, dispute settlement under TRIPS would be north versus south, would be developed countries taking on developing countries, and there, there would be endless trade sanctions, or in the more polite language of the WTO, suspen suspension of concessions, uh, trade sanctions against uh, developing countries like Indonesia, you know, the, the legal harassment. Uh, we still haven't sorted out copyright enforcement, so we're going to get you know, trade sanctions. That was the concern. It has not worked out that, that way at all. And indeed, uh, because uh, intellectual property is built into the uh, broader trade law system, we've seen the reverse. We've seen uh, Ecuador, we've seen Brazil, we've seen Antigua, use the trade law system to leverage access to traditional markets, markets for uh, in the EU for bananas, the US uh, market for cotton, uh, to leverage access for, the, for their traditional exports, as well as Antigua uh, for online gambling services. So uh, a complete inversion, once again, of what we, what we thought would happen. Uh, this meant that uh, also that developing countries, in a sense, took ownership of this system. The concern was that uh, intellectual property protection would be seen purely as something that benefited the, the well-off countries, uh, the developed countries, and there would be no positive interest on the part of developing countries. We have not seen that happen at all, and the pattern of dispute settlement goes really the re reverse direction. It's extremely interesting, the political economy of this, as well as the legal facts. Uh, and uh, this, this chart really demonstrates that. All of the disputes under the TRIPS agreement about intellectual property protection that have been filed since 2010 have all been filed by developing countries against developed countries. Now, there's a lot behind that, uh, but uh, it's simply to make the point that uh, it, the assumption that TRIPS, the TRIPS multilateral system would be used by the developed countries uh, to put pressure on, to you know, apply trade sanctions to, under the rule of law, but to apply trade sanctions to developing countries, uh, that did not eventuate. And in fact, the trend in recent years has been in the reverse direction, which um, leads us to, to reflect on, well, are those rules up to date? Uh, do those rules really represent where we are today? In the first nego uh, negotiations in 1986, we had this puzzle, what are the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights? What is the slice of intellectual property protection that has its place in, uh, in the trade law system? But uh, since then, I mean, 1994, I mean, the, the whole world of intellectual property has completely changed, uh, as has the nature of trade, 
as has the relatedness between intellectual property and trade. Uh, these have been uh, completely tr transformed. Uh, people writing about this point out that uh, trade is a very different thing in the 21st century. Uh, goods are not produced in one economy and shipped entirely to another economy. They are made everywhere. They've made, they've made uh, through global value chains assembled in different ways with tangible and intangible IP uh, inputs. So intellectual property has become uh, a link in global value chains. And we see also trade in intellectual property as such. Uh, I've cut off the numbers there, and I don't remember them, but uh, the US receives a, a huge healthy surplus of payments for intellectual property licensing uh, that to some extent uh, greatly offsets the uh, trade in goods deficit that is that's politically so sensitive. Uh, and if you think of you know, trade in um, uh, smartphones and so on, so much of the value added is the, is the IP, is the design, uh, is the intangible content. And yet when we are measuring uh, trade in that smartphone, the entire value of the of the export is counted as going from well from china to the us uh, rather than un unpackaging uh, the the various inputs and uh, working out actually where do the benefits from that trade flow including to cupertino so we do have a, a a transformation of the very nature of trade we do have trade in ip as such that's what all those downloads are in my view they're, they're not trade in goods they're not, in my view, even trade in services, they're trade in IP as such. And we, say, we see intellectual property as forming part of, the, of these global value chains, pinning those chains together. This is a, a more theoretical reason why we are seeing this huge rise in subsequent norm setting. Because certainly the, the TRIPS agreement was not concluded uh, with an understanding that this whole, these transformations would take place. It, ironically, it was very much rooted in the time of intellectual property as being about really trading goods. Intellectual property is something embedded in physical goods, uh, and that's the way it would be it would be managed. Uh, so uh, this is one reason, one among several, one reason why we are seeing this upsurge in regional activity. Another reason is that uh, the TRIPS agreement did not uh, meet the the full expectations of an economy such as the US. In other words, developing country negotiators were successful in defending their patch to some extent in the negotiations. It was a negotiation. And so there were unsettled, uh, un unresolved ambitions on the part of uh, the major developed economies. So a number of reasons why there is this upsurge in, in bilateral norm setting. Uh, but it's much more complex than that. Many of these bilateral uh, agreements are between developing countries, for example. And we need to establish a, a clearer understanding of what, what the intellectual property dimension is of, of all of those agreements. To do that, uh, a couple of colleagues have uh, uh, done, a, done a research paper in this area, which is really our, our start, the start of us trying to get a, a systematic hold of this, this trend, this development of post-trips normative development, post-trips rewriting of the rules or elaboration of the rules. Uh, and you know some, some simple numbers, uh, and these are very conservative, very conservative numbers. There's a lot that we haven't counted, uh, but there's certainly at least 170 bilateral regional agreements with general intellectual property provisions in them. Uh, so we hear a lot about some of the big ones, the, the TPP uh, uh, and uh, US uh, free trade agreements, but there's 170 uh, between uh, uh, pairs of uh, bilateral partners all over the place. 116 have much more specific um, provisions which really do establish new or elaborate new norms uh, that take us well beyond the, the comfortable zone of, of the TRIPS agreement as, itself. And they're very diverse in character. Uh, again, uh, the only point of this slide is, is to express that diversity. Uh, that's the main point I, I want to get across. These are not 174 uh, carbon copies of, of more or less the same template. They are extraordinarily diverse in character uh, and they do cover uh, many fields of intellectual property, those within TRIPS, uh, conventional areas, copyright and trademarks, but, but also new areas 
such as the protection of traditional knowledge and the intellectual property dimension of genetic resources on which the TRIPS agreement is silent, on which developing countries have been pushing hard for new international norms. Well, we see them emerging in uh, a significant number of, of bilateral agreements, uh, as well as new areas such as domain names. And I mentioned that uh, it's not about one single template. Here are some uh, very crude attempts to map the diversity, the linkages between these different bilateral agreements. First in 2000, when it was a a uh, relatively new phenomenon, then in 2013, uh, an attempt to, to get a kind of a, a roadmap of how all these different agreements fit together. I stress these are very, very simplified uh, compared to the, the content, which uh, I don't think anyone, we've started the analytical process, I don't think anyone's had a, a really thorough look at these. Uh, because even thinking of how these regional agreements interact with our precious TRIPS agreement, it, it, they, it, they interact in many, many different ways, ranging from simply saying, we agree that the TRIPS agreement applies between us, um, thanks, we knew that already because you're members of the WTO, to really quite complex saying, well, when in TRIPS it says the following, well, we think that really means that you have to do this, this, this and this, really quite elaborate glosses and an elaboration of the TRIPS standards by two, uh, two parties negotiating separately, not as part of a multilateral process, uh, as well as many other, many other forms of interaction. Uh, the point of this slide there, there therefore, is not, this is a, a two day long seminar, just elaborating each of these points. The point here is the diversity, uh, that even talking about the interaction between these bilateral agreements and the TRIPS agreement, the way they interact, we still don't have an established typology. We still don't have an established analytical toolkit to understand those different interactions. Uh, because the, these new agreements have been coming down the pike, um, uh, well, they're, they're published, and we simply don't know how to fit the whole the picture together. Uh, one critical point, though, is when it comes to dispute settlement. I mentioned that uh, dispute settlement under the GATT gradually evolved from being less less diplomatic, more quasi-judicial. Uh, the blue quadrant here represents the number of bilateral agreements that have a quasi-judicial dispute settlement mechanism. So in the years before the WTO, before the TRIPS agreement, that was very unusual. Uh, since then, it has become the norm. This is very important systemically because, okay, we're going to have disputes. How do we resolve those disputes? We have a multilateral system, that's what I've been talking about, uh, which has this quasi-judicial character. It's, a, it's meant to find objectively what is the law and are you compliant with the law, uh, rather than uh, providing you know, arbitration or providing uh, other more diplomatic dispute settlement uh, means. Fine, uh, but we see then that, that trend dramatically uh, in, in, in place for bilateral agreements which means that we have a forum shopping question. Uh, so the, the bilateral agreements are not simply to establish a, uh, a means of communication, but also a means of determining whether you're compliant with these standards or not. Many of these bilateral agreements restate the TRIPS agreement, restate uh, the same standards or elaborated standards from the TRIPS agreement. So we do have a forum shopping question. This brings us to, finally, the lasagna. Uh, because this is very much about preferences and the way that uh, uh, different treaties uh, interact. We have, w there's no uh, term, there is no acronym that actually captures what this phenomenon is. They're not all regional trade agreements. They don't belong to the same region often. They're not necessarily about free trade. Uh, because they're increasingly about uh, convergent standards, such as IP standards, rather than free trade as such. They're not necessarily bilateral even. And they're not, uh, s some purists like to talk about preferential trade agreements. Uh, that, that's, a, that's, that's in trade law, but they're not preferential when it comes to intellectual property for a very important reason. Bagwati, uh, our, our trade economist, uh, 
was very negative about uh, preferential trade agreements, bilateral agreements, where two, two countries agree to drop their tariffs uh, uh, preferentially, one, one, one uh, against the other, uh, excluding the rest of the world, uh, because that leads to strands of uh, preferential uh, uh, tariff settings that become almost impossible to understand and follow, that become a spaghetti bowl, a tangle of bilateral preferences that become almost impossible to understand in a world where we have global value chains, where goods are produced everywhere uh, through through global value chains. So his his uh, famous critique of this was to talk about a spaghetti bowl, and and that's what it does look like. This is a very very modest mapping of some uh, bilateral trade agreements. Well, we don't have that exact problem in when it comes to the TRIPS agreement or to intellectual property, because the TRIPS agreement, uh, if you, if in a sense, outlaws that kind of preference deal. It says that you, if you, if you do a deal, uh, if if I ag agree with you to uh, provide for patent term extensions bilaterally, the TRIPS agreement says, well, you have to extend that automatically to all other members of the WTO. There are no preferential trade agreements uh, when it comes to TRIPS standards. That's why we have lasagna. Lasagna is the layering of these additional standards. So if Diego and I agree on a higher standard of intellectual property protection bilaterally, we are both automatically required to offer that to all of you. Uh, and uh, so that means uh, we all, he and I, experience these layered uh, higher standards of intellectual property protection when we do agreements with others as well. We have this layering of higher and higher standards uh, rather than at the tangle of, um, of, of bilateral preferences, we have a layering of higher standards that we must extend uh, multilaterally to all our trading partners. So that has a, an enormous impact. Firstly, it does mean that uh, uh, we, we, we see higher levels of, of protection extended more broadly. Uh, it means that uh, dispute settlement forums about uh, these higher levels of protection proliferate. It raises deep questions about how we read these standards. Again, if we have a bilateral agreement that takes up uh, some aspect of our multilateral TRIPS agreement, and we say, well, we think that art this article means the following, does that flow back into the multilateral system and tell us somehow, or guide us, or influence us even um, indirectly, as to how we should read those those uh, standards, and in a in a practical sense, it means that uh, we lose negotiating leverage, because if Diego and I do that deal, I can no longer use that enticement, that preference, to you, to to extract a concession from you. So it does have really dramatic effect on the on the system, both uh, institutionally, in terms of dispute settlement forums in terms of the standards, the way standards are elaborated, and in terms of negotiating um, uh, dynamics. This is the, the layering of standards, this is the lasagna, but because these are complex, uh, because these are, are very difficult um, uh, provisions to understand, it is not a neat layering of, uh, of lasagna. If uh, an expert cook like my wife did it, it's more more like that, as if I did the lasagna. So we have externalities. We have some norms, if you like, oozing out and uh, affecting other areas, but in a way that we, we simply don't have clean cut boundaries. We do have a major analytical problem. Uh, this, this is a, uh, a, a challenge for us today. And uh, we see a number of, of these, these bilateral agreements that in effect, potentially set up bilateral forums for resolving disputes about our multilateral agreement, which, which raises deep questions about uh, the, the, the functioning of the rule of law. Finally, when it comes to the issue that I mentioned earlier, what is the very uh, cause of action? What is the foundation of a dispute? Uh, is it simply non-compliance with the treaty or is it a broader sense of non-violation? Uh, among the many IP provisions in regional trade agreements, we do see a number actually establishing that this much broader, much more unpredictable uh, cause of action, the non-violation 
uh, dispute. And uh, that, that to me is, is symbolic of the uncertainty that can potentially be brought into the, into the system by this way. So we do have uh, uh, 22 of these agreements that, that have this uh, far broader cause of action and it is an increasing trend. This at a time when the WTO uh, since 1999 has not been able to resolve this in the, in the, uh, the open multilateral environment uh, and uh, still we have a huge debate among our members as to what this means. Meanwhile, we are seeing this really quite potentially radical development of uh, uh, international intellectual property law being established at the, in the bilateral agreements. And it's not uh, a north-south matter. It's not, uh, it is present indeed in many of the US FTAs, but in many others as well. Uh, and uh, we simply do not understand uh, how this has come about. So it's one example among dozens where we do need to have a really systematic uh, conversation about what is going on here. Uh, on the one hand, we have a, a very formal discussion in the WTO going up to ministerial level again and again and again about this matter. Meanwhile, we are seeing these developments in a whole host of bilateral agreements. There's one example uh, of two countries that have not uh, uh, agreed to this in the multilateral system, but have agreed to it bilaterally. Many other examples that I could mention. The TPP, uh, it, it takes an interesting approach. It says, we won't allow this uh, new cause of action, this broader cause of action, but if the WTO does, it, does agree to it, uh, then we'll, we'll return to it. I take some heart in that. It means that we are still relevant <laughs> uh, to that extent. But I wouldn't count on, a, on an outcome on that very soon because it's still unresolved. To conclude, uh, this is not a new problem. The Paris Convention, the foundation of in international industrial property law, uh, was a reaction to the proliferation of bilateral agreements. So there were 69 in force uh, concerning, or commercial agreements concerning uh, industrial property at that time. Uh, and uh, the impulse in the invitation to, the, to the, the initial negotiations was to talk about inconveniences that arise from inconsistent access that require common action of, of all civilized states. The question I have is, does that inconvenience now go beyond uh, those, those, those formal questions that the Paris Convention addressed at the time and go to such fundamental questions as uh, what are the exact nature of our, our obligations to one another about intellectual property protection, deep questions of legal interpretation it, because things are much more judicial in the way disputes are settled, and then finally the forums, the forums we have to resolve disputes. These questions remain open and um, uh, I, I would conclude simply by saying uh, the point of my opening rant, uh, if, the, if the very idea is uh, to have the rule of law as the foundation for greater uh, stability, greater predictability, greater peacefulness, the reduction of tensions in the international system, how do we maintain that? Uh, do we, can we maintain a common core? Can we maintain that's a bad term in, in this jurisdiction. Can we maintain a central uh, set of set, sense of legitimacy when there is all of this uh, diverse norm setting taking place, or will we see a clustering, a I won't, I won't say fragmentation, but a, a clustering of different ideas about what is, what are those legitimate expectations that are the foundation of the dispute settlement system? If you come to the WTO, do come you'll see a statue of Swiss peace and Swiss justice uh, at, the, at, at the front door. The very idea being that it is the rule of law internationally that is the foundation of peace. That sense of justice and legitimacy does help hold the, this, this fragile world together. Uh, we do need, do, do need a common sense of legitimacy, of justice, of rightness of the system. Uh, the TRIPS agreement in its own modest way is an attempt at that. Uh, and uh, yet it clearly didn't meet the expectations altogether of all of its parties. Uh, we are seeing uh, numerous attempts to, to develop, to, uh, to establish a, a broader legal framework. How can we hold this all together so, that, uh, so we do maintain these fundamental goals of international law in this area? So thank you very much. Q&A, however, 